some people that you call when you don't know that much about a topic, but you're supposed to. Um, and I'd never been in the pet industry when I got here. So four years ago, I was like, oh, how am I going to figure out all the things related to protein sourcing? Because that's a big, big topic. Um, and so I called Chris. And I was like, Chris, oh, there's these really scary issues that are going on in our industry. And I don't even know where to begin. So we just talked. And then we talked more, and we talked more, and we talked more. And we continued talking over the last couple of years. Uh, about our industry and about protein sourcing and about what's coming and where we can go and what the opportunities to innovate are, what the solutions are, what the problems are. Um, and so that was my introduction to Saber Institute. And they also uh, have a hub here locally. So I get to work next to some of their team um, at the Impact Hub in Boulder. So that's fun too. Um, but they invited me to an event last year and I have never seen a room full of people who just like so teary over the moving stories um, that you know, the hubs of these people who are working the land. Um, and I left and I went home and I was like, Nick, I want to be a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's going to play one of those for you and you might feel that way. And you can check out the whole collection and then you're really going to feel that way. But uh, they're focusing on things like wool um, and meats that are relevant to our industry. And so I really want to, them to come and share some of the work that they've been doing. So uh, Chris, was a rancher for nearly 15 years before joining the Savory Institute. Um, and with a long-standing passion for regenerative agriculture and better food distribution systems, Chris has dedicated his life to helping connect ranchers and consumers in ways that create synergistic value for both sides. With formal training and instinctive talent, Chris utilizes media in concert with traditional marketing techniques to help ranchers share their stories and build long-lasting relationships with partners based upon common goals. So welcome. Thank you. You notice my bio didn't come with a long list of Ivy League degrees, so sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, as Caitlin said, we've been collaborating for the last couple of years. It's been a really fruitful relationship. And I, and I want to tag on to what was said earlier about how great it is to really be part of a front lines movement. You guys really get it. This isn't something that we have to go back to square one. And so we can have really relevant conversations. There we go. So I want to start today talking about some friends of mine. I think these friends are, these are actually cows that I owned. Uh, I think these are, they're, they're widely misunderstood in the marketplace, but I actually think they're heroes. And I'm going to try to make a case for how they're saving the planet. So our founder, Alan Savory, uh, you may have seen him or may, or may have not. Uh, but he did a TED Talk in 2013 that became one of the most popular TED Talks of all time. Uh, it's had just shy of 4 million views at this point, and it's all about grazing animals. So if you haven't seen it, Google it. But I'd like to start every presentation talking about this quote that he has. I think it's a good way to frame the conversation to get us started in this dialogue. Ultimately, the only wealth that can sustain any community, economy, or nation is derived from the photosynthetic process, green plants growing on regenerating soil. So our organization is all about grasslands, uh, which are amazing, but they're vastly underappreciated. Uh, but they're responsible for sequestering carbon, functioning water, water cycles, uh, abundant food cycles, and over a billion people live on, on pure grasslands. So we're not talking about savannas, tundras, we're talking about just pure grasslands right now at the moment. Of those pure grasslands, 70% of them are degraded, mostly desertifying, which means that we've got broken food cycles, food shortages, failing economies, broken water cycles, and climate change. So one of the, the things that Alan is really famous for being dogmatic about is his unyielding position that only managed grazing animals can save civilization as we know it. And he does this through a technique he developed called holistic planned grazing, which I think is a little bit easier to understand as regenerative solar farming. And I understand I'm introducing a new word, regenerative, that mostly we've been talking about sustainable today, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But let's pretend we're a plant. So everybody took high school biology, we all learned, for those of us that didn't go to the Ivy League schools, we, we at least got this in high school. Um, and, and we learned that uh, the equation there, but no one ever remembers the equation. I've gone all over the world and I've, I've asked people, no one ever remembers the C6, H12, whatever it is. Um, but what we can remember is that you've got water in the soil, you've got atmospheric carbon dioxide. Through the power of photosynthesis, the plant's able to break those two compounds apart and give you a carbohydrate, sugar. And what's left over is oxygen. So it's a really important thing. We want as much of this happening in the world as we can possibly get. So now we're going to talk about grazing, which seems a little counterintuitive. So I'm going to ask you guys 
to participate. I like that we just did a really participatory session, so that's great. Um, but which is worse? If we have two paddocks, two pastures that are entirely the same, for all intents and purposes, they're 100% homogeneous, which is worse? To have one, one cow for 100 days or 100 cows for one day? So you get to define worse. Worse is up to you. So I'm going to ask people to vote. On the left, who thinks it's worse to have one cow for 100 days? Okay, about half. Who thinks it's worse, worse to have 100 cows for one day? Okay, about a quarter. Who's really good at math here? Because I think we missed a few. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the plant's perspective. So you're the plant. You're chilling. You're cruising along. You're doing your photosynthesizing. Great things are happening. But now you get old. It's the nature of life. It happens to everybody. Things slow down and eventually stop. Now that sunlight that was your benefit is now your enemy. Okay, so now what happens here is the sunlight oxidizes this plant. It's chemically burning it. And what happens is carbon dioxide that was sequestered over time gets re-released back into the atmosphere. But the really important part here is now you have this standing skeleton. You have this thatch, this material that stays there. And without some sort of disturbance, will stay there for a really, really long time. What that thatch does is it shades out potential future growth. Uh, which doesn't allow new grass seeds to germinate. So if we go back to when the plant was cruising along and it was alive, and now you've got some animal comes in that takes a big bite. Now your solar collector is damaged. What are you going to do? You're going to grow. What's your mechanism to do that? You've got a short blade of grass and a, and a root down below. Some of those sugars that you've been storing, you take those and you pull those soluble sugars up. You regrow the blade of grass, and you let the bottom bit of root die off. So the sugars go up, regrow the blade of grass, but to do that, you have to let that bottom part slough off. Now this bottom part sloughing off is really important. We're going to come back to that, but I want you guys to think about that. It's a really cool thing that just happened. And then over time, with enough um, time has gone by, then that root can regrow and you build resiliency back into the system. So now we're going to switch back to our cow equation. So in the left there, I've got one cow for 100 days. And that cow is cruising around, and she goes, to us, it just looks like grass. But there's actually quite a few species out there. And the more species, the more biodiversity we have, the more resilient the system is. So she goes out, and she picks her first favorite thing, and then her next favorite thing, and then her next favorite thing. And over the course of a few days, the plants that sloughed off their root and regrew, they look fully healed to us from above the ground. It looks like, hey, we've got this back. But she goes in and bites again, and we've just broken what we call the law of the second bite. Because now we haven't had enough time for the root to regrow and rebuild sustainability back into the system. So we pulled money out of our savings account, and we didn't make time to put it back. In the system on the right here, where you've got the 100 cows for one day, they go in and there's competition. So just like the buffet back here, you've got that plate of cheeses. Maybe there's one cheese that everybody likes, but if all 70 of us went back there at the same time, you wouldn't wait to get the one cheese that you wanted. You'd grab whichever one was in front of you because you're hungry. And the same thing happens there on the right. Competition is built in, and you eat evenly, and you mow evenly. And it becomes a uniform catalyst that happens in the pasture there. The other interesting thing, if we go back to our first side there, that cow that's picking her favorites, and then her next favorites, and then her next favorites, isn't picking the things that she doesn't like. Now, those things might actually be healthy for her. Uh, that The animals on the right get a more balanced diet because they eat more diversity. But so now she's, we've already defined that she's overgrazing those plants that she likes, but she's simultaneously undergrazing the ones that she doesn't like. And that's a really bad thing. So an example of this that I really like to use is the Hornada Research Station in New Mexico. And so back in the 50s, the picture on the top here when that was taken, uh, they were allowing grazing to occur on their land. And they were starting to get some shrubs. You can see some shrubbery there in the background. Even though it's a black and white photo, uh, you can still make out the shrubs and see those. And they said, this is what we want. We want a pure, healthy grassland. And we think those shrubs are coming in because overgrazing is occurring. So they said, we're going to exclude all livestock. No more livestock are going to be on this property. We're going to fence them out. Even they went to the point to where they were fencing out some, some native grazers. Said, we don't want any grazing to happen because we're going to let this land rest and heal. If you look at the bottom, that's what it looks like today. This photo was taken in the last two years. And what's changed? We've got a lot of shrubs a lot of bare ground, and what grass is there is that gray color. That's that oxidized grass. That's a dead grass. It could have been dead for 30 years, and it still looks the same. And this is what that looks like up close. 
So you can see the bare ground around there. You can see there's some yellow material. That'll be from the last two years. And everything that's gray will be older than that. It's really hard to age how old it is, but it could literally be decades to 100 years old. And you can see this process happening in a, in a thatch roof. Uh, this is a photo I took in Zimbabwe when I was working with uh, a community there. And you can see that it's just the sunlight just penetrating that top layer. This is all the same age. And so the material at the bottom isn't getting that chemical oxidation. OK, so we go back. We've got our land. We've got some grass growing. We were lucky to get some grass to grow. But at the end of its life cycle, we've now figured out we want it to biologically decay. We don't want it to chemically oxidize in the sun. In places where it's humid all year, this isn't a problem. Because microbes in the soil and bugs, it's mostly bugs, will act as your grazers, and they will break down all that biological material. So they're going to bite it into small bits, poop it out, or make it into smaller pieces that then can get incorporated into the soil. In places where we don't have that happen, where you've got humidity for part of the year, and then a period of dryness. In essence, you get this, this big mass of growth. So you had your wet season, everything grows up, and now you've got all this biomass, and then it all stops. It dries out. And because there's no water, the bugs and the microbes either have a mass die off and or go dormant. OK, so now our mechanism in nature here to break that material down isn't there. This is what it's like on all the areas that are brown. It's about 2 thirds of the world's land is what we call brittle meaning it's got this period of humidity or, or a wet season and then a dry season. Also happens to not be where many of our people live. So most of our policies, if you look Europe, the East Coast, all of our big cities in Asia, they're all in places that are non-brittle. So the mass of human population is now becoming more urban, and they live in places that are non-brittle. They don't understand these brittle environments, and our policies then don't reflect that. But if we go back to nature, these are the places, those brown areas, those places that have a dry season and a wet season that are very, this juxtaposition, this stark contrast, this is where nature employs the beauty of the rumen. So the cow, or the, the native grazer, uh, she's mobile. She's got four legs. She can get around. Those microbes can't get to new water. So I call the cows our, our portable pack of microbes. She goes in and she takes a bite, and it goes into her rumen. Now a rumen, the first chamber of her stomach, if you learned that in, in, in biology or a uh, life science class as well. It's that first chamber, and it's like a giant fermentation vat. So it's like if anybody in here is into making their own kimchi or sauerkraut, it's very much similar to that. It's warm, it's dark, and it's moist. And that's everything that bacteria like. So the cow's not able to break down the cellulose in the grass any more than we are. She's a mammal just like, like we are. But the microbes break it down for her. It's a symbiotic relationship that happens here. So they break it down, they make it into small pieces, they make it bioavailable. And then when it moves into the next chamber of her stomach, because those microbes have exploded in population, she actually farmed protein from that. So those microbes become an additional protein source for her. And then they go into the next chamber, and that becomes an additional source of nutrition for her, while at the same time, she provided a nice home for them. So it's a really great symbiotic relationship. So if we want our grassland farming systems to look like nature, this is what it looks like. It's large groups of herbivores bunched and moving all the time. But what keeps them bunched and moving? One thing, and I love this about the last talk about learning about the human brain, one of the things I really like about working with livestock, I've been doing this for over 15 years now, is that we share some social software with them. So livestock are a social species, and they develop hierarchies. And so an example I like to relate with this with humans is, if there was a theater, and there's one other person in there, how likely would you be to go sit next to that one person, right next to him? Probably not very likely. It's a little weird. In most cultures in the world, that would be a little weird. But you're kind of happy in this dark, big, ominous room that somebody else is there. It's the same with livestock. So now let's say in the next scenario, I'm opening the door to the theater, and I'm pushing you in behind me. And as I'm pushing you in, I'm locking the door, and I'm telling you, somewhere in the shadows, a mountain lion's hiding. How likely are you to be hanging out with that person now? <laughs> Some of you probably in their lap. <laughs> and it's the same with livestock. When there's that predatory pressure, they stay together, and they stay bunched and moving. And when they stay bunched, they defecate and urinate on their own land where they're eating their lunch, forces them to move on even faster. And so you build in uh, this natu natural cycle of movement. And so that's what our farming systems look like when we mimic our natural systems. So, Landscapes can be ineffective, and they can be effective. These two properties are neighbors. This is in Mexico, and the property on the left uses very standard grazing practices. It's a very extractive process. 
And the property on the right uh, has built in, using our methodology of grazing planning, a way to heal their land. So on the property on the left, when it rains, that soil's compacted, it's dry, and the water runs off. There's oxidation happening, and so that CO2 is oxidizing back out of the soil. On the property on the right, the H2O, the water's got a place to go in. There's all sorts of mechanisms for it to go into the system, and then life begets life. It's a positive upward, upward cycle, and we're sequestering massive amounts of carbon while we do it. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, this is rotational grazing. I've heard about this summer before. I read it in a magazine. I've got a rancher friend. Um, I get this. It's way more than rotational grazing. We've been rotational grazing for millennia, and we've built the vast deserts of the world. What's different about holistic planned grazing is that it takes a triple bottom line approach. And so we look at the social, the environmental, and the economic all together. And so when we're planning for grazing, we're looking at, of course, forage production. We're looking at the livestock needs. But we're also building in things like, what do native li wildlife need? What do they want to really flourish here? What kind of piece of land do I want to leave to my children? Uh, if I'm doing crop production, what kind of needs are there? When are my lo low cash flow times? When am I uh, short on money? When am I long on money and want to make some of the investments that I'm going to need later in the year? Um, am I building in time for my family? Am I making sure that I have stable relationships? Are we taking vacations? Are we doing the things that are important to us for our life? And so I call this the molecule of well-being. Many people today have talked about it, uh, these, these three pillars. Um, but I like to think about it as a molecule because it, it relates well with this analogy of can you manage the hydrogen in this glass of water? And that's the same thing we're doing. We're trying to run our businesses managing them just for profit. If we're not looking at the social and the environmental impacts as well, we're doing just the same. So this is what holistic planned grazing might look like. This is a very rudimentary example. But, okay, so I want to take a family vacation. Let me move down to this paddock here where uh, I've got more feed. It's really easy keeping. I don't have to worry about things. I'm going to plan all of this at the beginning of the year. So this is not at all reactive. This is proactive. Okay, now I'm looking at this paddock over here. No, nope, that's not a good time because that's when the ground nesting birds are there. So that's not a good spot to be, okay, so scratch that from the plan. Okay, after that, we're going to go over here. This is our easiest paddock. Uh, it's closest to our house where we live, and it's my low cash flow season, so I'm going to lay off some employees or, or let them take vacation or whatever. Uh, and then now we move over here. Okay, the birds have migrated out. They've moved on. But this is also where there's lots of shade because it's down along the creek and the animals really need shade in the summer, really uh, boosts their health. Okay, we're gonna come over here. And then let's say I'm running a business. I've got some sort of direct sell scheme that I'm a part of. Uh, I wanna finish my animals in the best pasture. This is my best pasture. Okay, I'm gonna finish over here. And then most important, I don't recover. I don't come back until I have full recovery, until the roots have fully regrown. So again, when we're looking at the human view down, not just because the, the leaf blade is regrown, but we've had full recovery of the roots. And so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal a slide from our friends at Kiss the Ground, but I really love the way they put this together. Uh, we share a lot of similar values with them. Uh, but we really see this as a ladder, as three steps. You've got degenerative systems, you've got sustainable systems that are net zero, and you've got regenerative systems that are net positive. We want to plan for this. We're trying to be right here in regenerative. So everything we do, we're trying to stay in the net positive. Once something's trending in the positive direction, it wants to stay trending in the positive direction. And so that's what we put all our energy towards. And the joke here is we try to make it so easy that a child can do it. But if you, if you look at the, the plan there, really what you do as you're building your plan, as you're a rancher and you're, this, is, this is now your world and you're, you're changing the way that you operate, so talking about change theory, we're, we're changing the way that we do things, is that you're really mapping out all the places that you don't want to be at certain times of the year. And then the plan really just draws itself. This is where I do need to be for all the right reasons. And then you build everything again around that recovery. So that's a quick primer in holistic management. But closing that section, everything's scalable here. It uses resources already in place. It doesn't cost money. It makes money. Um, it's completely applicable to you know, any part of the world. And it has the ability to positively impact areas that aren't usable for anything else other than grazing. So going back to the Savory Institute and what we do, we take a collaborative entrepreneurial approach to changing the world and to rebuilding grasslands. And we do that with an intentionally different business model. We think there's a ton of opportunity out there for this. Land degradation costs an estimated $40 billion annually worldwide from the UNFAO. The estimated cost of mismanagement of all natural assets to the world economy today is about $6.6 .6 trillion or 11% of global GDP. This one's my favorite. The annual loss of 75 billion tons of soil costs the world about $400 billion per year. Let's think about that one for a minute. 
So every year is what, what he's saying here. 75 billion tons of soil disappears. And we have about 7.5 billion people on the planet, which if I'm just doing some quick cowboy math means for every human alive, 10 tons of soil gets eroded every year to grow one ton of food. That's how much food the average person eats in a year. That's not going to work out too well. <laughs> so our philosophy is that we need to empower ranchers and farmers. We need to measure the outcomes and we need to grow the movement through strategic partnerships, which is how I got involved with PSE. <laughs> um, we do this through what we call a hub strategy. So we have um, proxies in a region all around the globe. So these are people that come to us. It's kind of a, a quasi-franchise model, but they come to us and say, we really want to be the leaders of this in our space, and we empower them with everything they need to be successful there. So they, in essence, license the tools from us, and they go out and they run it in their own regions. And these folks do everything from consulting, they do market aggregation, they work with policymakers, they uh, work with researchers. Uh, I call them centers of innovation. They're really the place, the spark in a given region to make this happen. We currently have 30 of those around the globe that are either in the process of being accredited or already accredited. And I need to update this slide. Uh, I've got the new numbers I just called in uh, this week and, and I need to get it updated. But we've, we've now impacted seven and a half million hectares just since the Savory Institute started in 2009. So our movement of holistic management is older than organic. It goes back to the 60s is when it started. Uh, and it's about the same size as organic. But this is just since our starting in 2009, we've positively impacted seven and a half million hectares of land. Now a hectare is two and a half million two and a half acres, so we're at about 19 million acres around the globe that we've uh, done this just through the hub strategy. And we've trained about 4,500 people now, so I know that says 3,100, but we're at about 4,500 now. Our goal is to positively impact a billion hectares of land by 2025. To do that, we need 100 hubs to be going around the world. So we grow by about 10 or 15 hubs per year. And what we think this will change, we think at that point, if we reach a billion hectares of land, we think that's a tipping point to start to see reversals in climate change, see water and food security come back, and to start to see poverty addressed on a global scale. So I want to show some examples of what this looks like around the globe. I, I, this is one of my favorite slides. I like to joke, which side gets more rain? Okay, so this is in the Karoo. This is in South Africa. Uh, the property on the left is using holistic plant grazing, and the property on the right is traditionally ranching. Uh, this is a property that, uh, the property on the left, uh, two of our co-founders, Andrea and Tony Malmberg, were managing in Wyoming, a multi-generational ranch. Uh, they're actually farming three times as many cattle on that property. And these two are neighbors, and there was a, there's an overpass that goes over this creek. And so she went and snapped a photo over here. Three seconds later, walked to the other side, snapped the photo over here, and that's the more desolate one there on the left. This property here is in Zimbabwe, and uh, this is where our founder, Alan Savory, uh, lives and works. And this property has had a 500% increase in the number of cows they carry from the nearby neighbors and from when they took over it in the mid-2000s. Uh, and this is the results we've seen. This is, these photos are four years apart. And these are also featured in his TED Talk. This property is not too far from where I live. I live in Northern California. This is in Sonoma County. This is two years ago during the worst drought in California's recorded history. So ignore what happened this year where I live. We got 80 inches of rain this year. Um, but <laughs> during the worst, worst drought in recorded history, uh, this is in March. Uh, so this is March 8th. So the left side, one of the reasons I like this photo is on the left side, this is actually native grazers. This is a safari s school slash zoo adventure place uh, where they come out and kids can come do safaris and things. And so this is Kudu and Impala that are grazing on the left side. And on the right side, he has twice as many animal units. So an animal unit is the lowest common denominator to make apples to apples. He has twice as many animal units, and this is, this is beef cattle that he's grazing on the side. This is what it looked like in May that year. So again, worst drought in history. Now, if you know anything about rangelands, you're going, well, wait a minute, these are annuals. Okay, so these are um, a lower successive state than perennials. I'm still going to take this all day long over that, and this was only his second year in. So we've established we have producers around the globe that are doing really cool things, that they're making their land better, demonstrably better. What's the state of the market for those people? So regenerative producers don't really have a way to differentiate their product in the marketplace. I think a lot of us are talking about that here today. Um, the standards that do exist, do exist are pretty burdensome, pretty difficult, and may not fully capture the story of what they're doing. And at the same time, you've got market partners that are desperately looking for transparency and traceability, better stories to tell, and a way to 
communicate shared values with their consumers. So I've got a little video here that we're going to try to turn up the volume and play. And I'm going to not touch the microphone. Okay. <laughs> I got expressly warned that if I talk into the microphone too soon while the video was still playing, it would be very, very loud. And I would blow your ears out. Um, so I, I like, to, I like to, to interject that piece, but we have to remember that people aren't voting with their forks, that we're voting on our pet's behalf. So we've started a new program that we call Land to Market. This is designed to be an accelerator of everything that we just said is a goal of ours. Uh, but it's designed to connect regenerative producers with the end consumer through brands, many of which like are in this room. Um, and we think that's going to displace existing livestock supply chains that are losing relevance in the marketplace. Consumers aren't real happy with the way that livestock are currently produced. I don't think that's a, a surprise to anyone in here. So for 30 plus years, people that have been doing holistic planned grazing do what's called biological monitoring. And so they measure the health of their own land to be able to make decisions on that land. Until now, there was no way to aggregate that data. It was just left, uh, it didn't leave the ranch gate, as I like to say. So it just was used in the office as a way to make internal decisions. So we started thinking to ourselves, what if we aggregated that data globally? What if we could then move it through the supply chain and we could differentiate product that's healing the land? So we came up with what we call the ecological outcome verification. So this is extremely robust. Um, and what we measure in this, we've added a few things that we, we didn't measure in the past, but we've, we've grown the biological monitoring suite a little bit. But soil water infiltration rates and soil holding capacities, uh, soil organic carbon, organic matter, uh, wildlife populations is something that we're adding in. We're working with the Nature Conservancy, Heaven Lee on that. Uh, my, microbiology health, so this is the big trend right now. The new frontier is really what's going on beneath your feet. Uh, science really doesn't have a way to encapsulate this yet, but we're working with some really cutting edge people to look at uh, microbiology health and looking at what's happening there. And all of that to say, that gets rolled up into what we're calling an ecological health index. So each property is in essence getting scored. And it gets scored in a way that we can compare it across landscapes. So you can compare a property in Argentina to a property in North Dakota to a property in Turkey. And then that allows the market to normalize those numbers and say, yes, this is truly a regenerative product. Uh, and now I can buy exclusively that product or work in a mass balance approach uh, to uh, bolster my supply chain. So these are the contributors we worked with. I mentioned the Nature Conservancy. They worked heavily on the wildlife component part. Michigan State University has been very involved in this. They're actually one of our Savory Network hubs. Uh, so the university there, their, um, their school's farm uh, is a demonstration site for our methodology. And then they've agreed to house all this data at the meta level. So they'll be doing meta analysis, looking for noise, making sure that everything's working the way that it's supposed to be working. Texas A&M, Dr. Richard Teague, and our partners, Obus 21, our hub uh, down in Argentina, their ecologist team has also been very involved in this. So what we come out with is something that's very scientifically robust. It's outcome based. So producers must qualify. Their land has to be healing before they're eligible for new market opportunities and for premiums. We want this to be distinctly low cost. Right now, most certification programs out there put most of the brunt on the raw material producer, and we're trying to move that to where we've got skin in the game from everybody from the very beginning. Uh, that, that business plan is still being developed, but we're having multi-stakeholder meetings to make that a reality. Low bureaucracy, this is like core DNA number one. We want this to be as outcome-based as possible, and it's, it's hard, you know, you keep running against the walls, well, what about this? What about this little use case or scenario? Um, and, and we're really trying to be as outcome-based as we possibly can with this. We want it to be, a, another core feature is transparency and traceability. The industry, uh, all industries are desperate for that right now. We're working with meat, dairy, wool, and leather are our primary starts, uh, the main things that come from livestock. Uh, but we, we see that potentially advancing into other markets as well as we go on. Uh, and then we want to create new markets that convey those values to those end users um, that go all the way back to the producers. So talking a little bit about consumers, the consumers that we see engaged in this are people that are really committed to making a difference. Um, I think of this as very similar to the organic demographic, but, but plus plus. We're going to add to that. Um, and so we want to help them align with their values for environmental restoration, thriving local economies and communities, healthy products for them and their family. This one is a big one for me, a role to finally truly vote with their dollar. Because right now, a lot of the programs out there, they're very assumptive. We, we pay to be part of a program, and we think it encapsulates all these things, but it really doesn't. And so this being outcome-based, you're really getting what you pay for, uh, and then a chance to participate in a movement to change the world. Now, taking this back to pet food, 
I think there's an, an added interesting opportunity here. And as I was doing some research getting ready for this event, um, I, I, was, I was digging around on the internet and I came across this article where many vegetarians and even vegans still feed their pets a meat-based diet because they think that it's right for them. And so there's a real opportunity here. I think there's a, a broader market for the pet food industry in protein sourcing because because even the ones that have said no to the current system, and for many reasons they say no because they're unhappy with the way the system runs. When they see change, they come back. But an entry point for them is with their pets. And so they're very, very picky about what they get. And so I think this is an opportunity for the pet food industry to really be a leader on this front. Our rollout timeline for this program is, is this year, 2017, is a prototyping year. So we've brought on 10 hubs that have agreed to be a part of this, 10 of our 30, and each of them have said we're gonna bring in 10 producers in their region, that everyone's gonna get the transects done, we're gonna do the data collection, all of that's starting to, happening, starting to happen as we speak. Um, and then we're doing a finalizing of a seal, so for people that do uh, a whole line that's dedicated to regenerative product, they can have a forward-facing seal on the front of their product, and all the branding and everything that goes with that. We also have an assets package that we're working on for people that are taking a mass balance approach that say, hey, 20% of my supply is gonna be this this year, 40% next year, 80% by 2020, whatever it is, as they ramp up. So how are they gonna be able to communicate with their consumers that they're still participating, but they're not at 100%? All of that's being finalized. Uh, and then, like I mentioned already, we're working with a multi-stakeholder group to build this together. So there's co-design. So much to what you, you were saying earlier, that everybody has skin in the game, they feel heard. So where we're headed with that is to, like I said, a forward-facing seal on the segregated folks that are doing 100% for specific lines. And so our goal is to be testing products by the end of this year in stores and really looking at what the value prop is, both for the brand, for the retailer, and for the consumer. Um, but are, are, can brands expect to get better store placement? Can they sell more product? Can they uh, get a higher margin? What kind of press can early adopters plan to get? So that's something that we'll be testing starting this year. Uh, I know a lot of you guys probably work with certifications, and so I think this is a really good grounding slide. Uh, situation, there are four, 14 competing standards. 14, ridiculous. We need to develop one universal standard that co covers everyone's use cases. Yeah, soon. Situation, there are 15 competing standards. That's not what we want this to be. So we really see this as an ecosystem, and we think that each player here manages a different value for consumers really, really well. Um, and so we want to own regenerative at the very top there, uh, organic, grass-fed, welfare. This is obviously based around meat, non-GMO verified, and then we heard about B Corp this morning. We see that as kind of an ecosystem. We're working with some think tanks that think they can roll this up into a single mark so that we don't get uh, you know, certification fatigue on the producer side and label fatigue on the consumer side. So we're very active in those conversations. Last year, we launched what we called the Consumer Revolution, starting to tease out some of these conversations that this is where we, we're headed. We made four documentaries, and I think I have enough time to show them to you. Caitlin's gonna be flexible and give me a couple extra minutes. <laughs> All right, so that was, that was for an event that we had here in Boulder uh, last October. Uh, but that gives you a taste of the types of stories that we're producing. So, like I said, we did a short video for meat, dairy, wool, and leather. Uh, I can pass that to the PSC team and we can share those links with you guys. They can send them out to you. But we think that story is a big part of this movement. We think that, that story is the way that we connect with people. It's very primal in how we communicate. And I love this quote uh, by our friend Jonah Sachs, author of, of Winning the Story Wars, free range uh, media based in Oakland and Washington, D.C. These guys did the story of stuff, they did the Matrix, they did a Star Wars spoof called the Store Wars. The stories that spread today empower us and give us belief in our own heroic potential. And so we really, we wanna own that, that these stories are empowering uh, and it goes back to our brand. Um, so maybe you're asking yourself as I, as I come to a close here, what can I do with this here? How can I be involved? And, and, I, and I loved what, what uh, Cynthia was talking about here of, of who wants change and who wants to change. Everybody wants change. Very few people want to change. And so we're, we're living at this nexus down here at the bottom. Um, so we're inviting people to come along with us, to be part of something that's really groundbreaking, really cutting edge, uh, but that has all the, the chaos and the mess and the, the fun of that journey. And so that's where, where, where we are in the process right now. 
Um, like I said, by 2018, this is going to be a lot more fully baked, but we're starting to play with brands now on this uh, and get some forward-facing um, products in the marketplace. Another thing you could do if you say, hey, I would like to learn more about this is visit your local hub. So we've got hubs all over the globe. This is our hub network where they currently exist. This is in North America. And so the local one here in Colorado is called Cold Harbor Institute. And then I'm just going to flash through a few photos of our hubs. I'm not going to have time to tell you their stories, but these are some of the amazing individuals that we work with around the globe and their amazing landscapes. And all of these are, are really incredible, amazing places and amazing stories. Uh, the last one there is Prince Charles. He was working with a, a project with us. We're friends, uh, Alan Sabre, he's good friends with him. And he was working with a project with us in Mexico. But all of that to come back to say, hopefully uh, I've made a case for why, the, why these animals uh, are really champions and why I think uh, they deserve to be looked at in a different light. Um, so I like to close, again, being outcome-based on what do we want. We at the Savory Institute, we want thriving grasslands and all the myriad of benefits that come from that. We want thriving animals and that provide healthy meat for people in, in the, whether it's companion animals or the people in the community there. And we want thriving people in flourishing local economies. And so we invite you to join us. Thank you. And then questions? <laughs> so then I, I guess I have five for questions as well. Does anybody have any questions about regenerative grazing? Wow, they're popping up. Pardon me if I sound ignorant because I, there's a lot that I do not know. But how does set aside land play into this? How does what? Set aside land. Land that's set aside? Yes. So like a preserve? Like in the Midwest, farmers, it's very popular to see that they have set aside so you're probably talking about what they call CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. That's a government program that actually pays people to fallow their land. Uh, it doesn't pay very well, um, and if you can make the land better and have higher productivity, you pretty quickly opt out of that system. But there are lots of, part of the, the mentality we face that we're up against in the ecological space is this idea that if you rest, all land will get better. Well, non-brittle lands, the places that have humidity all year, rest is a great tool and it does get better. Places that have that dry season that I talked about, rest actually makes them worse. You actually need to remove that biological thatch um, to have that, that ecosystem function. So uh, we invite everyone to be at the table, um, but some of those schemes don't really work out in the long run like they're intended to. Yeah. Just what you said, why, why would anybody not, not do this? It just it makes, it doesn't look like it costs anything, and yet, just show the picture to anybody who's got some land. Right. Why would they not do it? So I'm going to go back to, there we go. <laughs> it's just change in the way that you think. And that's, the, the gray matter between our ears is the hardest, the last mile. I mean, it's the hardest thing to change. And so, so getting ranchers or farmers to change and the way that they do things when it's, it's a legacy of how they've done it for generations is a really difficult thing. Uh, I think we've reached critical mass on that, and I think that we're seeing it change. We talked about numbers like 5%. Um, I think we're seeing that uh, start to happen, and our flywheel is spinning faster than we even know how to keep up with. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a mind thing. Yeah. Question. Uh, first off, thank you. It's, uh, your presentation was an eye-opener to me. Um, I didn't have a lot of uh, understanding in this area and we, uh, I, I was I was outside of agriculture before I got into this journey in my teenage years as well so I can relate yeah no, pretty cool <laughs> uh, so I think that's what you're trying to do here at the PSC is bring people uh, like myself that are they're not the first guy dancing on the hill but I'm definitely the third or fourth guy coming along so but my question is um, so uh, the outcomes the grassland the animals the people but you sort of talked around a little bit about one of the outcomes being climate, climate change and sort of reversing what we're seeing right now is the right. warming of our climate, right? Um, do you have data to support that? Is that part of your whole mission here? And so this you, big, this- Leave me hanging a little bit on that part. Yeah, so, so sorry for that. Um, so in those early slides when I talked about we're pulling carbon dioxide out of the air, where it's, it's not beneficial, and we're putting it into the soil where it is a source of fertility. So we're taking a negative and we're making it a positive. And this happens biologically, and so it's not something that we have to figure out how to scale up, pay for, build technology. It all happens on its own. Yes, we are measuring for that in our new data platform. So that's something that we've added to that biological monitoring that ranchers in our program were already doing. The hard part is the science is still a little bit out on 
the best way to measure what the lowest common denominator for carbon measurements are going to be. Um, and what's out there is very expensive. So you may have a property that it might cost $20,000 to measure the most robust way to measure carbon. So we're looking at some alternatives there uh, as a way to ground proof indicators towards carbon. The easiest one, and this is, we're gonna go for more depth than this in the early stages of this project, but the easiest one is that soil organic matter is roughly 50%, 56% carbon. And so we can just make an inference from that at the very lowest common back of the envelope kind of level uh, we can go from there. And that's where a lot of you have been operating for a long time, but we know it has to go to more depth and we have to take it to the next level. So we're very engaged in those conversations and making that a reality. Uh, but again, the scientific community hasn't come to full establishment yet because the soil really is the new frontier. We don't know, we know more about the moon than we know about the land beneath our feet, honestly. And so we're trying to figure out that world. And so the carbon cycle is still a little bit mysterious of how it all ebbs and flows, what's deep carbon, what's natural volatilizing carbon that happens all the time. They call it li libel fractions. And so that's, that's where we, we still have to figure some of that out. So, yeah. And, and as carbon markets develop, they really drive that conversation. So we don't have anything yet in North America that's based on grasslands. Our closest thing is in California. They have carbon markets around oak woodlands. Um, and so hopefully that will start to evolve into other natural ecosystems and we'll see it in grasslands soon. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got hubs in Sweden, Norway, far north Canada. Bobby, help me, who am I forgetting? Uh, we've got a hub coming on board in Minnesota. We've got a hub coming on board in the Dakotas. We uh, no. <laughs> we do, uh, we work with some Russian guys that are doing some, some crazy stuff of trying to like bring back like aurochs and mammoths and stuff. Um, <laughs> But that's a whole different discussion. Um, but, but yes, absolutely, we can do this on permafrost. Anywhere that has native grazers, so it's, it sounds like I'm making a pun, but we do a lot of work with reindeer grazing. Um, that people up in, in Canada and the far north in Europe, uh, in Norwich, that are full-time reindeer grazers. Yeah. Um, this could be, let's go next. Um, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the efficiency of the system? So all land is currently dedicated meat vegetables compared to this. Would we have to eat less meat? I stay away from advocating how much meat people should eat um, for a very distinct reason. I don't want to make that choice for you. But when you choose meat, choose meat that's regenerative. And if you're choosing meat that's regenerative, I think it comes um, with a lot less guilt of worrying about how much you have to eat. So actually, I think the conversation is, is driven largely around quantity and not around quality. So Meatless Monday, not a solution to the problem if the other six days of the week you're still eating degenerative product. So starting there. Um, but in terms of global scale numbers, we've got enough proof in the box from what we've done over the last 40 years around the globe that pretty much everywhere we can double your production in the first year or two just by finding inefficiencies in the way that most people graze. Those inefficiencies are, inefficiencies are in time. So then, as we change those efficiencies, building that grazing plan out, we can usually double your production. As the land gets better, it goes on from there. So people that have been doing this for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, they're at three, 400, 500% increases in their production um, without having to make major investments to get there. So absolutely, yes, scalable. Um, I don't think the right question is, is quantity. I think the right question is quality. If we base it around quality every time, I think we always win. So that's my approach on that one. So you hear a lot about like methane, all the methane and the cows produce and stuff. So when you're talking about regenerative meat, is that also offset that issue? Yeah, so that's another one that the scientific community doesn't really fully understand how the methane cycle works. Here's what we do know. We know that this planet used to have many times more wild ruminants than we have wild or domestic today. Those happen to be before cooling trends, not before warming trends. So if we know that, if the scientific community wild, wildly agrees that we had more wild ruminants than we have wild or domestic ruminants today, something is off on that. And so I either think that's in, one, the way that we manage them today, or two, in how we measure that impact. One of the things that, that I see where a lot of the research is happening is in a bacteria that lives in the soil called methanotrophs. Methanotrophs eat methane for breakfast. It's all they eat. They love it. What kills methanotrophs? We have way lower populations than we've seen even in the last 50, 70 years. What happens to kill them? Nitrogen fertilizers that we use on our croplands. And so we don't have that mechanism that used to cycle it back into the ground and turn it back into other carbons 
that were part of that fertility cycle. Um, so again, there's still more research out on that. We don't have a definitive answer, but looking again just from inference, if we used to have more of those animals today, they can't be the whole problem. And there's clearly something we're missing in the cycle. And I'm putting my money on the methanotropes. I think that's a big part of what we've changed. And these salt and petroleum-based fertilizers kill those critters, uh, which then ruin that cycle. Yeah. So uh, Chris and I met the first time over in Paris at the climate talks. And we were staying in a, the same pension that had like 200 people in there with like eight different organizations, Kiss the Ground, Savory. Organic, Organic Consumers Association, uh, iPhone. Yes, and um, one of the first days I heard a presentation about this regenerative agriculture and I'm like, wow, this sounds too good to be true. The next day up on the chalkboard in the um, cafeteria area, there was a sign that said there are many ways to stop climate change, but there's only one way to reverse climate change. And throughout the 10 days or so that we were there, there was session after session after session of how this is really the only way to turn the clock back by sucking down the carbon. And it's amazing what this whole regenerative agriculture movement can do, and it's really just now coming to light. I would love to see that seal, whatever you guys are coming up with, so that it's pet food and treat manufacturers, we can identify the ingredients that we want to go into our products and make sure they're regenerative. <clears throat> One of the fun things that we did was for two full days, we put Monsanto on trial. <laughs> yes, it was in a big auditorium somewhere in Paris and we had people sitting up on the front as judge and jury and somebody representing Monsanto in the jury box. And all, you were you, were you there? Yeah. Wasn't that fascinating? Yeah, was all the different stuff that's going on with those fertilizers and pesticides that are just changing everything. So yeah. keep up the good work. Buddy. Thank you. I'll pay you for that later. Um, yeah, the soil is the only solution. And that's it. So, you know, we're at 407 parts per million now. We need to be below 350. Keep in mind, that means if we stop every negative thing that we do today, it's already baked in. We're already screwed. We have to figure out ways to go backwards. And the only way to go backwards are biological means. I don't know anything out there that scales up. Nothing, nothing that I've seen, even in R&D world, is even close to scaling up and something that we could actually impact on a global level and or afford to pay for. So the only way to do it is through nature. And the way to do it through nature is in the way that we produce our food, because that's our biggest land use. So the soil is the answer. All right, thank you. I almost got the shepherd's crook. It was this close. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, incredible. It just makes you think about things totally differently. Um, you know, all the guilt that you have about eating meat, or maybe that I just have about eating meat, but really thinking differently about regeneration.